And, and so let's talk about trust because I think without trust, you don't have anything. You don't have a cohesive team. You don't have anything like that. So how do you build trust? Because I think that a lot of people just assume that it will be in place because you're the leader and, and there's a subordinate. But in your experience, what are some ways that you've built trust with your teams? Because I think, again, that's just such a fundamental component of leadership. In your experience, what worked, what didn't, for example? I, I, again, I think it goes back to you don't punish somebody for making a, a, a good faith decision that maybe would have been the decision that you make. Uh, you approach that as, okay, we probably don't want to do that again. And here's why. Um, but you don't fire them. You don't crucify them. You don't uh, embarrass them. Uh, that's a private one-on-one -on -one discussion. But publicly, when somebody makes a good decision, make sure everybody's aware of who's responsible for that decision. Make sure that person, th those individuals get the credit for what they're doing, not you. It, it, it's not about you. It's about the people. And that's how you build trust is that's how you make sure that people are going to do the right things by encouraging them to make decisions. But don't be a worry, worried about stepping them on toes or making a mistake because we'll live through those, but let's learn from every one of mistakes. What I tell people is don't make the mistake twice. <laughs> This is, this is your learning opportunity. Don't keep making that mistake, but learn from it. Well, let's move on. Well, and say, no, say I build trust with the people. They, they know they're free to make decisions and that they're not going to lose their job or be brutalized publicly if they make the wrong decision. Because people make mistakes. That's how you learn. It, so what do you tell the people that, well, if I empower them, oh man, like it's going to be chaos. It's anarchy. We're going to have mavericks rope. within limitations. You have to set the goals and the objectives. This is what we're trying to accomplish. This is your area of responsibility. You have the authority to make decisions within, the, within that lane. And here's the limit of your authority. Unless you can't get a hold of the next layer, then do what you think has to be done. And then let me know that you've done it so that you we can adapt to whatever that decision may be. And, and I think there's just so much fear in general about stepping out of your lane and things like that. And so I, I really think what you're talking about are setting expectations as well. And so what role do expectations have and how did you set them back in, in your experience? Because in my experience, I can't hold somebody accountable for something if I didn't tell them what the expectation was and what the right and the left balance you were. Cause then it's exactly. ultimately, I, I set them up for failure. So how did you handle those types of things? We, as you well know, we, we operate under the incident command system. And so roles and responsibilities are clearly identified in that management system. Tasks and chains of command are clearly identified and training there, there was copious amounts of training that went into every one of those positions. So people didn't just one day suddenly find themselves with the title of logistics section chief or operations section chief. They came with, with experience. And, and I would think that's the same in any large corporation is you don't just one day walk in out of college and get the director's job or a, a supervisor's job. You have to work your way up to it. So it, it. It, it's a matter of making sure you put the right people with the right level of experience and what it might not be your standard day-to-day -day, uh, supervisors today. It might be something where you do a, a field expedient promotion to somebody who's got the skills and the knowledge and the expertise at this moment in time to solve whatever that unique problem is that you're facing. And it's probably different than your day-to-day -day normal business decision is how do I, instead of how do I maintain my distribution system, how do I take care of people? Now that may be a different person in your organization than you would rely on for the other stuff. So yeah. It might be, and, in, and I think picking the person who's most qualified at this time versus the person that's most senior again, ICS, just cause you've got a chief's badge on doesn't mean you're qualified to be the particular person in the management team, just because you're a, 
a, a politician elected to the position doesn't mean you're qualified. You might have the authority and the responsibility, but you're a fool if you don't pick someone who's got the capability to do the task at hand. Don't tell them that, Tom. Yes, I know. <laughs> <laughs> so well, good leaders surround themselves with experts and then delegate and get out of their way. And then they give the credit to those people for doing what they're doing. And in return, that's recognized that that was good leadership. So that's exactly what we should be telling people is get out of their way, put the right people in the right positions, let them do their job with parameters. And, and why do you think in your experience, people are sometimes reluctant to surround themselves with smarter, more capable people? Because I, like you, I think when I look around a room, if I think I'm the smartest guy in the room, then I'm in the wrong room. In your experience, why is it sometimes hard for people to, to surround themselves? You know, I don't really know why you wouldn't want to do that other than ego and pride. That's that ego has got to go out the door. Turf's got to go out the door. You have to start thinking about what am I trying to accomplish and how is the best way to get there? And if I don't know something, I need to find somebody that can teach me or tell me what the best way of accomplishing something is. And you dig deep to find those experts and you never stop digging. If you're the person responsible and the leader in charge, you never stop digging for information that helps you make better decisions. And when you identify somebody who is getting things done, making good decisions, you grab them and you make them part of your team. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I would totally agree. And with that in mind too, I think it goes back to your objectives and creating a mission driven culture first so that you know what you're trying to achieve and then you work backwards. And then in my experience, and I'd like to hear your opinion, a lot of that ego just kind of dissolves if you're putting the mission first every time. Do you have any thoughts or comments on that? No, ab absolutely. We, we manage by objective. What can I accomplish? in this first operational period, this first 24 hours of this event, what can I accomplish with the resources that I have at hand? That's all I can focus on. That's, that's, that's doable. If I look so far forward, trying to do something that's light years in front of me because I don't have the resources or the money or the materials to do it, then I'm wasting my time. What can I do right now with what I have available to me? What do I need? to continue this process tomorrow. Where am I going to get those resources, that funding, those people to do the job tomorrow? So it's multiple phase. What can I do right now? That's operations. What can I do tomorrow? That's plans. Logistics gets me the stuff that I can continue my plan into the foreseeable future. So break it down like that and think only about what am I trying to accomplish today? Another one of my favorite sayings is today is better than yesterday. Tomorrow will be better than today because we're putting things in place to improve the situation tomorrow. When you walk into the initial uh, disaster state, it is truly amazing to see the chaos and the dysfunction. And your goal is to try to eliminate that dysfunction, is to get, start getting people something to make their life better tomorrow than it is today, whether it's better food, a roof over their head, um, running water, lights, a generator, anything, communications, you're giving them something to improve their situation. And so that it's no different in this particular situation is, okay, things are pretty grim right now, are they? And it doesn't mean that it's not going to expand and there aren't going to be more people getting sick and it's not going to start looking worse, but is my situation getting better? Is my ability to deal with the situation getting better? Am I, have I got the resources in place to deal with people when they do get sick? Do I have a plan in place for what to do if, if this plan doesn't work? So I can start thinking about the next steps down the road. If I take it one day at a time and start thinking about what's going to come next and do I have a plan for that? And what's my objective today? and then start thinking about, and then put somebody to work, work dealing with that plan for today. And then somebody else starts thinking about, okay, this is happening today. What are we going to do tomorrow? What am I going to need to keep going tomorrow? So that's, 
incident command in a nutshell, as, as you're well aware, is you're always looking forward to the next operational period, whatever you decide that is, but you can only deal with the, the things today that you have the resources and people and tools to work on. And so don't try to get too much done. Mm -hmm. So Tom, the leader, I, I know that back in the day, it used to be very much a leader centric world where if I want your opinion, I'll give it to you. And that, that kind of model, but nowadays we're starting to hear words like vulnerability and empathy and compassion in terms of leadership. So how would you, so I heard you talk a little bit about really being empathetic to the team and whatnot. What does that look like on the ground? If I'm a leader and somebody tells me to be empathetic, like in your experience, because it's all about empathy when you arrive on scene, frankly, what does that look like if I'm not by nature an empathetic person or I don't understand it, what does that look like boots on the ground kind of thing? Like how have you done that over the years? I, I try to put myself in, in their shoes. If this was my community and that happened to us in Oso, the landslide, but in other places it's okay. I've now, let's just take Hurricane Katrina. We arrive 16 hours after landfall to a community that's been dealing with it for 72 hours leading up to it and going through it. And you're standing there talking like we are face to face with the, the person in charge of the community. They don't know if their family's alive. They don't know if their home survived. They don't know what they don't know because they've lost all communications. They're standing in a building with no, no roof left. Uh, it's leaking rainwater on top of them. They've got no power, no toilets, uh, no warm food, and they're trying to get it organized. So you got to put yourself in their position and realize they're going to be short tempered. They're very frustrated. They don't have a lot of time for you. So you've got to make it as, you know, easy on them as you possibly can. Cause now you're coming in to their world. The first thing you want to do is not ask for stuff I need. No, what is it I can do for you? I'm here to help you. This is what I've brought. And so empathy in that world is different than what we're, we're seeing today. Cause we're all in the same, but we all are, are facing the, the same dilemma. Uh, so it's not unique or out of our world of experience or a realm of experience to understand that we don't know where tomorrow's paycheck's coming from. We don't know, you know, what, what tomorrow's going to look like as far as, am I going to be sick? Am I going to be healthy? Uh, so there's a lot of unknowns in, in the thing that we're facing. And I Is think it that get that's... worse before it gets better. Probably. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I know that from a leader's perspective, just speaking for myself, sometimes empathy, I have to be, I'm by very nature an empathetic person, but sometimes I have to remind myself to be empathetic because when there's a lot to do, it's come on, we got time and time. We got to roll, got to roll. But I consciously have to tell myself, look, dude, pump the brakes, be empathetic, spend some time having a cup of coffee with somebody, be present, have the conversation. And a lot of people just want to know they're being heard. And it absolutely. So just a, a quick uh, story about empathy. Uh, again, going back to Oso, we had, uh, I can't remember the exact number, 64 families that were impacted. So we had a large number of survivors and family members who just wanted information. And for a while, every day, somebody different would come in and talk to them. And, uh, what we did and what my team did is I assigned three people to those families. And, and their task was find out what their needs are. If they need to go, because they were cut off from going to the site, they were not allowed to go and see things. They were getting misinformation. They were seeing things on television. They were watching human remains being hauled out, but the medical examiner was saying, we've only identified one person and they didn't understand the process. They said, but you've recovered many more than that. Why is there only one? So my tasking to these three individuals, very good, uh, capable first responders that said, your job is to take care of the family. I don't care what their need. I don't care what it is they want. You find a way to meet their needs. That's empathy. 
If they want information, get them the information. If they need a visit, figure out how to get them that visit. If they, if they need uh, some special information, uh, find the person to get them that special information. And that was a huge win for us as a management team, because now suddenly the family was in our ballpark rather than, than a hindrance, but rather than one of those outside um, uh, influences that took a lot of time. We focused on those people because they had, a, they, they were stakeholders. They had a specific need to know specific information that they weren't getting through the media. And different people coming and telling them different things was just making them angrier at the response. And I didn't need 64 families being angry at the response. I needed them in our ballpark. And so their, their, their task was to be empathetic. I didn't care what their request was. If that's what the family needed, we were going to try to find that. And, uh, and then the other thing we did, uh, we did a memorial for four officers who were murdered here in Pierce County a, a number of years ago, a shot down in a coffee shop. And I, and one of our goals on the, on the memorial team's wall was what does the family want? Not what we want, not what we want to see. What do the families want? And it was always came back to that when we'd have our daily meeting as a team is, okay, is what we're doing, what the family wants us to do. And if they don't want it, it's not going to happen. And so you got to put yourself in the position of, of the people you're working for and that you're striving to support is what do they need? Is it information? Is it support? One of the things that just drives me crazy right now is, and it, it's throughout my career, I've preached family support. You got emergency responders, now doctors and nurses and medical professionals working in the hospitals. And when they get off of their 12 to 16 hour shift, they're lucky. They're supposed to go stand in line at the grocery stores and get food and water and supplies for their kids. Right. No, we've stripped those places bare. So why isn't there somebody taking care of the, their needs. When a nurse or a doctor comes into work, you should give the family support unit a list of needs. Okay. And that family support unit goes and stands in the line. That family support unit goes to us what needs to be done. So when they get off work, they take a care package back home so they can actually go sleep. And so our disaster response has to start thinking about the people that are on the front lines. What do they need? And how do I support their needs as an organization? And, and that's a whole different way of looking at things because yeah, do your eight hours and go home. You, you're off. And now it's do your 12 to 16 hours and go home. No, yeah, we got to take care of people and that's what's not happening. Yeah. And that's a really good point from a leadership perspective. It's about knowing like your job is to, is to support the people supporting the people. Yes. It, it's not about what is happening on the front lines. It's making sure that your team has that and empower them to just go ahead and do that. And I, I think that that goes back to when you said your job, when you're walking around with a cup of coffee and hand in your pocket, those are some things that you're looking for. You're not worried about how many cases do we have or all of these other things. You're looking at monitoring the pulse. And, and so what are some ways that, that you do that, Tom, when, so you talked about you're looking for race voices or changes. So from a practical perspective, how do you know if how things are going amongst the team. Like, how are you able to do that pulse check? Well, again, I always like to have two meetings, one formal meeting with my entire, with my command staff, the people that uh, are making decisions, and then one informal meeting with the whole team so that everybody knows what we've accomplished. Today. I usually do that at the end of the day. What have we accomplished today and where are we going tomorrow? And then hear from individuals about what's frustrating you, what's not working for you. And don't wait till the end because those fester and become huge issues if you don't address them on a regular basis. So uh, your, your, your group of leadership that is making the decisions is one meeting, but you need to have a meeting with everybody involved in, in, in dealing with the issue, your whole team, whenever possible and say, okay, what's not working, what's causing you frustrations and you'll, they'll appreciate it and you'll hear and see what the little things that you might not be privy to, the smallest of things can be what's causing the conflict or somebody not to be able to get something done. 
And that's where you also hear about, okay, so we've been trying to solve this problem for three days. Why is it not? Why can we not solve this problem? It's because such and such down there won't approve it. Okay. So the other thing that I find is oftentimes decision makers are way down the food chain, but they're bureaucrats or they're the person that has to sign the check. And if they don't understand what your goals and objectives are, and they don't understand the working conditions that the people on the front line are facing, such as the nurses and the doctors right now, they don't understand, uh, exactly what their needs are. They're going to deny requests. They're going to pigeonhole requests. Are they going to go, what is this? And put it aside. And that's where you have to dig deep and to find out why are we able to solve this particular problem that seems so simple. And it's usually because someone way down the food chain is using their power to overrule the operations in the field. And that's, I think what's imperative in this today's dynamics is it's not business as usual. Your normal business rules for protecting your accounts and managing your funds. You've got to make sure that the people down below know that this is our goals. These are our objectives. And yes, we are going to approve these kind of things without the normal process. And yes, they do have the authority to, to use the credit card to buy that. And yes, they do have the authority to order this material. And yes, you will pay the bill. That's what I find usually happens is somebody way down the food chain doesn't understand the, the current situation in the field and you got to support the people in the field. In, in when the people times sit at home trying to survive. Yeah. Go ahead. Literally. And, and what I find too, is those people down the food chain, they're well meeting. They're not intentionally holding something up. It's just that they haven't, they're not aware of the new reality or they may not be empowered. So one of the things that, and I'm just curious to hear from you, but one of the things is I'm empathetic. I'm like, Hey, let's not get mad at them. Let's not hate them. They're doing their job as far as they know, but it's our job now to educate them or help them out. So trying to keep everyone like we're all in this together. Right? So that's, and that's, it's so off those people don't work directly for whoever's in charge of the, of the, what's going on in the field or, and the bigger the organization, the more deeply rooted that becomes, whether it's a state government, a large corporation, or God forbid the federal government, you're trying to get something approved and somebody who only works nine to five in an office back in another state has got to approve it. And that it's, it, you got to get rid of those roadblocks. You've got to find a way to, to get around the rules and regulations that you've established for a normal business day. Are those the things that are hampering us today from getting the job done? And yes, those are the things that are causing us problems today across the board. Not easy to get out of the way, not easy to, to fix, but it's something that you, the leader has got to become aware of and ask the question of why hasn't this happened yet? Why don't we have more masks? Why don't we, why are we releasing this equipment? Find out why. And that means doing a deep dive into the system as to where the bottleneck is, where the restrictions are, and whether it's a rule that you put in place as the CEO that was per made perfect sense on a normal 911 day, but it's not a normal 911 day. It's a disaster day. It's a totally different world we're facing. So look at those rules, look at those regulations that have been in place for years, find the people who are doing due diligence, doing what you hired them to do, but let them know rules have changed. Here's how we're going to now do this business. And I want to make sure we don't lose the fact that or lose sight of the fact that when you have the informal meetings, you've, you, you need to have a culture as a leader where people are comfortable saying those kinds of things and bringing them up. And that work happens long before that particular meeting. Would you agree? Absolutely. You have to, you have to instill that, that confidence in people that they can speak up, that there shouldn't be any fear of, I'm going to lose my job. If I tell somebody that what you're doing is causing me frustration. Okay. What am I doing? That's causing you frustration. I need to stop that. And uh, that's, that is a tough one, but trust me, I, I've been called out by my own people it says, Tom, <laughs> you, you need to stop doing what you're doing because you're, you're putting in. A, a kink in the works. Okay. 
got it. I will stop doing that. And, and you just got to recognize that we all are going to make mistakes. We all are going to occasionally step out of the line. And if somebody calls you on it, go, yep, you're right. That's your job. I'm going to step back and let you handle it. That's usually what happens is someone says, Tom, I'm dealing with this. Let me deal with it. When I need you, I'll let you know. Okay, got it. I'm out of here. <laughs> you keep doing what you're doing. I, I think the, the best example of that was, uh, again, at Oso, when we couldn't get things to approve because the county had to approve every financial expenditure. We went, actually, my logistics chief actually went down on day four or five, took the financial finance director for the county out into the field and said, hey, let's go have lunch at this place that you're not allowing us to have a contracted food service. And as she's, as her plate of terrible food is filling up with rainwater because it's pouring down rain, she's going, is this how you guys are eating? <laughs> yeah, that's how we're eating. This isn't good. Uh, or sh showing her why we needed a fuel truck and that the, the excavators that were knee deep in mud couldn't drive 20 miles to the only gas station that was open that we needed a fuel. So just making them understand and giving them a clear picture of this is the world we're living in. This is why we need that stuff. All of a sudden that roadblock opened up and became a, a clearer path for getting things done. Cause now that person who was legally and tasked with the responsibility of watching finances understood there's a need for these things out there. And if I have a question, here's the person I go to, to say, why are we doing it this way? And so that, that took five days, but by the end of five days, it got better. <laughs> things yeah. got better the next day. Cause you've just described every finance department and every corporation across. The exactly. Exactly. And, and, and you could do it in a respectful way. There's this perception that, well, you know what, I'll go talk to them and I'll, I'll change things. But I think ultimately that's probably not the optimal approach. So you can certainly lead upwards and you can talk to people as human beings. Would you agree? You have to talk to people as human beings and understand where they're coming from. I hired you originally to do this. We're going to change the way we're doing it because here's why. And here's what I need you to understand. And. Uh, Thanks for doing what you're doing, but we got to change the way we do business. I've always heard to the irony is organizations, um, during a disaster, there, a lot of processes are changed and so on and so forth. And monetarily your, your accountabilities go up and all these other things and you can buy whatever you need. So if the disaster ends on Friday and then Monday business as usual is, sorry, you can't get business cards. When Friday, you just spent a million dollars on security fencing. I've always found that interesting too. So that's part of leadership too, where you have to manage the Churchill was a good example, great wartime leader, but post-war was an absolute disaster. So as leaders, we have to know what environment we're operating in because you can't use, if all you have is a hammer, every problem's a nail. So, so, knowing so the other, I, th I think the other thing that I think people need to realize at all levels is how our system of government works. And I think one of the frustrations, uh, for everybody, and you look at social media and, and it's a bit different in the United States than it is in Canada, but all disasters start at the lowest level of government and you as a business individual, if you own a business in a city, your first point steady food within area of knowledge and, and resources, then you go to the city and say, I need help. And if the city can't do it, they go to the county. And if the county can't do it, they go to the state. And then the governor goes to the federal government and says, we are out of resources. I need help. And that's what's playing out right now. But people are frustrated because the federal government's not jumping in and doing this, or the state's not jumping in and doing this. And I've been called on the carpet many times by trying to insert a federal resource at a state level. I say, you can't do it. Or I, I haven't been called, but I've had to counsel my people. I says, we can't do that because the state has not asked us for that resource. And people just get absolutely frustrated to no end. But those are the rules we live by. And, and right now, those rules haven't changed. 
and probably won't change is the feds are there to support the states. And until the governor makes that official request for that local subordinate government, you're not getting anything at the upper level. It comes all through the state. And so if a governor is focused on the big city of Seattle and a small town of Oregon wants something, they haven't asked for it. They're not getting it. And that's what people don't understand. And that comes down to businesses as well. You got to understand the flow of support all starts at your local government and goes up through the governor to the, to the federal side. And again, I know that's a little bit different in Canada, but, uh, people get so frustrated. I have to give civics lessons all the time about who's responsible for what right now. The big, uh, uh, deal is why wasn't the federal government more prepared for a pandemic? Why weren't the states more prepared for a pandemic? Why weren't the counties more? They all have public health services, but it takes money. And it, if you have a stockpile of stuff, it requires people to manage it. It requires a warehouse to store it. It requires due diligence to make sure it doesn't expire. After 9-11, billions of dollars of that stuff in warehouses, it all expired. It all went outdated. It all went to the dump. And nobody was willing to spend additional money to continue that support. So to say that somebody in particular was negligent, that goes across the board when it comes to being prepared for something that you can't, nobody could envision it. So therefore nobody was prepared to defend against it. And that's what happened is nobody could envision what this thing looked like because none of us were alive in 1918. <laughs> exactly. And we can't envision. From a leadership perspective, one of the, the models that I use is can control and can't control and how much time we spend wrapped around the axle of things we simply can't control. So Absolutely. Leader, I think that's a big part of my job too, is, hey folks, I get that that's a problem, but we can't control that right now. So what can we control? And so what are your thoughts on can control, can oh, control? Absolutely. That, that's a, a basic tenet of incident command is focus on the things that you have control over. Identify those things that you can't and let people know you're aware of it but it's outside of my ability to do it. I don't have the resource. I don't have the money. I don't have the tools right now to attack that issue. Let's start planning to get the stuff in that we do need so that we can address that if it's critical. But some things are just out of our control. We can't control the weather. We can't control the environment in a lot of cases. So quit worried about it. Be aware of it and move on. And modify your operations to meet the, the situation at hand that you you can't make a change in. You can't change what the weather's going to be tomorrow. So one of my favorite sayings is navigate from where you are, not from where you wish you were. Because yeah. that's just so fundamental that we can talk about all the problems, but ultimately we are where we are. And I guess the, the balance between being realistic and still optimistic, because some people think realistic means negative and catastrophic. So leadership is sometimes balancing the two as being realistic, but also still being hopeful. So yeah. how do you deal with that? Well, I, I think it's critical that our business leaders tell their workers what their real situation is. Here's what I can do for you. I, I can reasonably help you for two weeks before I go bankrupt, <laughs> before I'm out of funds. We will try to leverage what Congress is done for us in business loans, but there's a limit to what I can leverage in that regard. We'll do everything we can be honest and upfront with everybody that are your stakeholders as a business leader. So that they, some of that uncertainty is gone. Um, again, a, a, a perfect example is a windstorm in 2006 devastated Washington state, Western Washington. We were out of power in some cases for weeks. And in my community, we got together with all the stakeholders and we said, okay, what's going to take to return power? And we got public utilities, uh, transportation department, phone company, tree cutting services, all working together. And then we told the public, you're going to be out of power for up to 10 days. And so the public went, out, oh. but they went out and did something. They prepared for 10 days, whereas a neighboring community, every day they said, ah, be another 24 hours, another 24 hours, be another 24 hours. After seven days of it, it'll be another 24 hours. The people were furious. Roads weren't clear. 
There was no sign of anything happening because, oh, it's a power problem. So only the power company was dealing with the problem. Nobody else was helping the power company. So one model gave the truth to the people and said, this is what you should expect. It'd be 10 days before we get power back to you. The other kept saying, ah, another 24 hours. And then everybody was angry and frustrated because that expect they weren't doing anything to prepare for the future. They were going, okay, we can last another 24 hours. Okay. We can last another 24 hours. So I think businesses in this particular case have to be honest and upfront with their people and saying, this is what it's going to look like when we do get back to business. If this lasts two weeks, if this lasts four weeks, if this lasts eight weeks, here's what you can expect from us as your employer. And I think the unknown is what's terrifying everybody. If they at least know, okay, they're with me for a while, but I need to start planning for the future. That's much easier to do than not knowing what your future holds for you. Yeah. The plan and, and, and let them know. In, in that way, it, it's really interesting because I was at Katrina working just north of Gulfport, I think Harrison County. And it was amazing to see. I, I, just, I've done this a long time and people typically ask Daryl, why do you do this? Like you see the worst in people, but I actually see the best yes. people. Yes. And that's why I do it. I'm always amazed at how people come together in these things. And in the absence of direction and help, neighbors are helping neighbors. And I really want people to recognize that during crisis, people actually act really well. And you're going to get worse. We're doing hires and the yeah. gougers, but ultimately speaking, we're all in this together. And is your experience much the same where it's, oh. you see the good in humanity? It, without a doubt, that's what stands out in the way I kept going back and, and doing as many as I did. But just like you said, we were in Gulfport at the water park with the FEMA teams and for about uh, 16 days there. And uh, we'd be doing uh, searches along the Gulf coast where nothing is left except a slab of concrete where a beautiful, you know, colonial home used to exist and three generations of family had lived and, and they're out there picking up anything that might be left and they're handing us water, thanking us for being in their community. And I'm going, whoa, whoa you don't give us yours. I oh, don't know no, here. We don't need this. And, and then other places you go in Greenberg, Kansas, after a, a cat five, a tornado leveled it within 24 hours. Entire communities have come together and there's truckloads of people helping the people who lost homes, families and friends, just coming together and collecting what belongings are left and, and patching up what they can and feeding each other. Yes, that's exactly what I saw in every disaster was the goodness of people and not waiting for government. Mm -hmm. And not being frustrated by the response, just recognizing that government can't be all things to all people, that I have to take care of myself and my neighbors and my family, and I have to be self-reliant. And I think we're starting to see that in a very big degree here with this particular event as communities are coming together, people are taking care of one another, people are watching out for one another for the most part. Mm -hmm. And that's what I want to take away from this is yes, people are going to take care of people, but they got to know what's coming I next. Uh, absolutely. And we're all in this together. So to wrap it up, Tom, you, with all of your years of experience, what's maybe one or two pieces of advice that you could give to a corporate America, a corporate Canadian manager who's facing a crisis? Maybe it's not just COVID, but moving forward. So if you were taken for coffee and you had a couple minutes, sat them down, what would you tell them? Cause they don't have the same experiences that you've had. So what would you try to help them out with? Again, t t take care of your people first and foremost, cause they're the lifeblood of your organization. If your people aren't there when this is over, your business won't be there. Uh, so focus on the people, communicate with them on a regular basis. Let them know what's happening, what the plan for the next foreseeable future is and recognize that you are not going to make everybody happy, that you cannot fix everybody's issues, that you are not responsible for everybody's issues, that taking care of families starts at home. Focus on the most vulnerable, focus on those that need the most help 
and recognize that there's a limit to what you can do and should be expected to do. But perfect. Yeah, team man. It might be a new team, but build a team to help you through this. Don't try to do it alone. I love it. I love it. What a conversation. Tom, thank you very much for taking the time out of your schedule. And I recognize that during this particular event, a lot of us are self-isolating. But thank you for taking the time and helping us out on this. I'm eager to see how this uh, fleshes out and, and how it's taken. I'm more than honored and privileged to be a part of this. And uh, with all the lessons that I've learned, I'm always willing to share because they're really no different. It, whether it was 9-11 or Oklahoma City or Katrina or this, the lessons are the same. You got to deal with people. Agreed. All right. Thank you, Tom. You're welcome. All Take right. care.